Um, I did not share my screen. The wonderful world of Zoom. There we go. Um, yep. We just can go into presentation mode. Perfect. There we go. All right. So we provide free, high quality legal services to income eligible small business owners on non litigation commercial lease matters citywide. That's a lot. Um, what we basically do is uh, what we call transactional legal services on anything related to a lease, which is the bedrock of um, any kind of physical business in the city. So I will go through all the different uh, kinds of cases that we take on. And um, as I mentioned, our program is free. It is full representation. So it's not a clinic. It is not a consultation. It is, um, we take on a client and on average, uh, that's for seven to eight weeks, but we have been with clients for uh, two and a half years ever since we, we started the program. And um, it is income eligible. What I will say about eligibility is that the vast majority of uh, small businesses in the city do qualify for our services. So we are funded by the Department of Small Business Services. Uh, we were given a initial two year grant and that has been extended um, for another year based on how well the program is done. And we're fighting to have it extended. Um, since 2018, when we launched, we have served more than 1,000 clients um, in every uh, city council district, in every borough, in every commercial corridor. And we are the only free full service legal services program in New York City for small businesses. Uh, we, Brooklyn Legal Services Corp A, another big name, um, that will uh, say Brooklyn A is the lead grantee and we are uh, we provide these services in partnership with uh, two other legal service providers, Take Root Justice and Volunteers of Legal Service, Balls. Um, very good. These are the eligibility guidelines. They are very um, low threshold. Your business has to be located in New York City, but you don't have to be living in New York City. You can live anywhere. Uh, you have to be a non-franchise small business defined by the SBA, and that's the income eligibility I was talking about. Um, your income has to be under 500% uh, of the federal property guidelines, and that is um, the vast majority of small business owners in the city. We, we prioritize uh, providing legal services to small business owners from communities that have historically and currently um, had little to no access to these kinds of services. So uh, immigrants, people of color, women, veterans, and uh, small business owners who are non-English speaking. Uh, and we have uh, made that priority very core to our work. So 99% of our clients are lower income. Um, the vast majority are immigrant and people of color, over 70%. 60% uh, are women, and a third are non-English speakers. And then we prioritize certain other things, uh, such as unwritten or oral agreements or no leases. Those are the folks who are particularly uh, vulnerable to, to landlords and um, eviction and areas in the city that have been uh, rezoned. This is just a, a list of what we do at uh, the CLA program. Um, everything from new leases and lease renewals, we, we try to get you the fairest deal possible mm -hmm to um, amendments, assignments, uh, fighting landlord harassment and correcting breaches of contract, um, terminating leases uh, in a way that is fair to the small business owner. And uh, particularly at this point, uh, negotiating uh, rental agreements, and payments, uh, deferments and abatements, so, uh, and amendments of course. So um, the landlord is not in a position where he can evict or they can evict. Uh, through the program, we are also able to refer clients who um, don't have uh, matters that are commercial lease based to pro bono partners. So if we can't help you, we will uh, do our best to find someone who can help you. And uh, we're lucky that we have some great partners, particularly uh, the SBLRA, which is a small business um, legal relief alliance that's a partner of us. And we uh, refer clients who are um, not eligible for our program to them and they're able to uh, acquire small business um, pro bono attorney. 
So um, here's a, you know, a, a few pieces of information on what small businesses mean to, to both the city of New York and to our economy. So you're welcome to, to look at that, but there are a few things I, I would say before we move on to small business owners and why this program is important. In the last uh, two months, two and a half months since the pandemic, uh, nearly 2 million businesses owned by immigrants and people of color have been forced to close. In many of those sectors, um, the majority of business owners don't believe they have the capacity to reopen. So this is a struggle, not just for independent businesses or not for individual businesses. This is a struggle to make sure economies are sustainable, communities are sustainable. Um, small businesses, particularly small businesses that we serve are usually disproportionate leading employers, suppliers of goods and services, cultural uh, anchors and pillars for their communities. They make New York what New York is. They make our neighborhoods what they are. And the city has a very stark choice. Um, as we know, many of these businesses, whether they're minority owned, immigrant owned, women owned, have been the hardest hit. They are in the areas and they serve the clients who are the hardest hit by the pandemic. And they have received the least amount of support um, from any level of government. And in these areas, this is a choice about investment. Um, we have protests across this country now, but what happens when the state decides to disinvest in its communities um, and the consequences of that? And that's a choice. Um, it doesn't happen just by neglect. It is a choice to say, we will not invest resources in particular groups, in particular communities. And our campaign over the next couple of weeks is to say to the city of New York, these are the businesses that are the engines of this economy. They were shuttered with 24 hours notice by the city and the state. And the least, the least the city can do with your taxpayer dollars is to say that they deserve these services that they've been historically um, not given and not given access to, that this is the moment where we say, um, we're gonna help in this recovery. And these are services that are super important. They're critical, not just to thousands, tens of thousands of small businesses, but to the long-term economic recovery of our city. So you will hear from our small businesses, you'll hear from our attorneys, and um, we hope you'll help. Um, so thank you. That is the, um, the CLA program in a nutshell. At um, the end of, of this webinar, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me, reach out to our team, our attorneys. Right now, we are not taking on clients um, because of, of the funding situation. And we have um, hundreds of, of open cases right now, but we hope um, within the next couple of weeks, we will be told that um, the program will continue and we are excited and, and happy to uh, start uh, taking on clients again. So, um, Sarah, should we move on to our uh, small business owners? Yes, please. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you, Ken, for um, that great overview. Um, and um, we are so excited um, to have with us today um, a number of small business owners who have worked with the program and uh, represent all um, different areas of New York City and different sectors. Um, and uh, we believe that the most powerful way to learn about our program is through their stories. Um, and to learn um, why we need to keep these services available. Um, so we'll uh, start off by hearing from uh, Ashley Gray. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, my name is Ashley Gray and I own Villainess, a secondhand designer black clothing store and event space at 181 Avenue B in the East Village. My business is located in Councilwoman Rivera's district. 
I reached out to the commercial lease assistance program after having already hired an attorney to assist with my lease initially. After signing the lease, I was, excuse me, sorry. The landlord disclosed that the backyard that was included in my lease space um, would be covered with scaffolding due to construction next door. I contacted the, com the commercial, I'm sorry, I wrote this down. <laughs> January, I was like, dispute. Oh, I had a licensing dispute with my commercial landlord. So contacted the commercial lease assistance program, um, which I found during a Google search. I was contacted less than 24 hours later and I received invaluable help since. If CLA were to be defund defunded, especially now, it would be devastating to small businesses, especially small businesses of color, which are historically underserved. Small business owners need as many free and low cost services as possible during the uncertain times and to defund CLA would be terrible for our community. That's all I have. Also, Black Lives Matter, Black Power. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Ashley. Um, we'll next hear from Jesse. Hi, welcome, Jesse. Oh, let me unmute you. There it goes. There we go. Hi, hi, everyone. And I've been in business for 45 years. It's a long time. Now you know how old I am. My social security number is 003 because I was the third one in line when they opened up the whole agency. That's how old I am. But I started working for Geraldine Stutz uh, at Henry Bendel's and I learned that retail had taken women, not so much women of color, but women in general out of a lot of bad paying jobs and harassment and retail was a wonderful way of getting through that and taking power of your life. Now, I was started out at 816 Madison Avenue where I signed the lease. Then I moved down to 39 Christopher Street in West Village. And over the years, I ended up on Avenue A in Councilman uh, Rivera's district where I live as well. So um, down here in the East Village at Galleria J. Antonio 43 Avenue A between East 3rd and East 4th, across from Two Boots. I always say across from Two Boots, they say, oh yeah, yeah, I know the pizza. But uh, the reason I said all that was because all five places that I've opened need legal services. I've had some bad and very expensive uh, lessons about opening up a, 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 because a lease is probably, one of the most important basic foundations, your lease should be able to support whatever business model you have. Um, I recently, during this pandemic, um, my leases here were amended. The landlord wants to defer our rent, not to forgive it. So that means that come October, we have to or November, we have to pay November and October and then what we owed back and make a balloon payment out of it. So we will probably be caught with a larger rent bill than we were expecting. So I got in touch with uh, Julian Hill from uh, Take Roots and uh, he advised me, well, wait a minute, he called, I, I emailed him and he actually called me back. That is like, what you're calling me back i do feel alone i mean i mean i don't have money right now for legal services and he said i will be glad to review it and look at it so just that touch that i knew that there was a lawyer that was going to help me through it because i got the agreement the first six sections whereas whereas where now i'm a great designer i'm a great jeweler i'm a fabulous retailer, but I am not a lawyer. Believe me, I'm like, duh, when it comes to law stuff. I don't know what I'm signing or what, what this is going to, how that's going to impact my store. But Julian was there. You know, the, the CLA program is, I, I can't believe, it just what made me crazy to find out that they were going to defund it. We've got rent, we've got taxes, we've got shoplifters, we've got permits. We've got uh, a licensing. We've got all this stuff on, on the internet that's eating up, Amazon's eating up our businesses. And now they're going to defund CLA program. I mean, that doesn't make sense to me when we most need it. So 
Um, I hope whoever's listening to this podcast or this webinar, or just please, it's not so much that we, we absolutely need it, and especially people of color. Because I show up, as soon as I walk in through the door, I'm outed. Because I'm chocolate, because I'm gay, because I'm broke. They say, no, no money, no power, next, next client. And you guys really embraced us. And uh, I would love to see um, that law that Jeremiah Moss was talking about, uh, the Small Business Jobs Survival Act gets straightened out. That's been in the city council forever, and we need to address that too. So please, that's my story, and that's my plea to all of you. Thank you so much for sharing, Jesse. We really appreciate it. And um, speaking of of the people that are with us today, we actually have um, 85 participants on um, this event right now. So that is a true showing of support and solidarity with the program. Um, and we are grateful to each of you here today. Um, and uh, particularly grateful for our small business owners. Um, so next we will hear from Gail Foster. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Foster. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I have a home-based childcare business. It's an early childhood program that makes children multilingual. How children acquire the Mandarin and Spanish language um, through our program. And it's doing so well that we are ready to grow out of my home. It's, it's a licensed home base, but we're ready to move into a, a, a licensed daycare space and even uh, have responded to an RFP with the city for um, a UPK contract. And so that means we need commercial space. And so I was um, going around Harlem and, and, and Upper West Side, and you know the gentrification that's taking place there. Um, what this means is going from $4,000 a month in rent to 15 or 20 or $25,000 a month in rent. And, and, and a lease like that, I mean, the kind of risk what you're taking on, your lease had better be right if you're gonna try to make that jump. And um, I really wasn't initially going about it the right way. I was using real estate agents and they were taking me to spaces. And if I liked the space, they draft an LOI for me, a letter of intent to lease. And then the LOI would, um, you know, I'd look at it and, you know, if I thought it sounded good, I figured, well, I'll accept this because this is just a letter of intent to lease. It's, it's not a lease. So when, when I'm really ready to sign the actual lease, that's when I'll go and find an attorney to look at it. And, and I found out that that's really late, um, that a lot of the things you're agreeing to, you need to know up front. And um, I also discovered because the DOE wants you to, <laughs> wants you to submit the place that you're gonna actually lease in their RFP um, before you actually get the RFP, I, I had to submit multiple LOIs, which means I needed an attorney to review like six, seven LOIs. And I mean, that was totally unaffordable. And so I was lucky to find, um, you know, Ivia at Balls Volunteer Legal Services and, and the Commercial Lease Assistance Program to, to look at all these leases, uh, these LOIs, and, and they did. And, and um, Frankly, you know, as I said, without their support, I wouldn't have known about, you know, abatements, you know, different real estate agents would um, draft different LOIs for me. And so some would have an abatement in three months, six months, one month, you know, um, various issues came up that I didn't know about landlord work plans for renovations. So I could not, and, and, and I know lots of other um, group family daycares that want to move out of their home into commercial space. And, and we can't do that without legal advising. So I think it's um, really crazy at this time of all times for, for the, um, you know, for the city to city council and Mark Levine is my city councilman for them to think about uh, defunding this program. The, the, the reality is 
that now that it's post, well, not post COVID, <laughs> but, but we're in a uh, post COVID world that's not post COVID. We don't know if it ever will be post COVID, but, but like, what about these leases? You know, I'm so lucky I didn't sign one. I, I have friends who did. And, 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 and now that I, I still wanna go forward, what kind of special protections do I need uh, and, and in this environment? And, you know, should the rents be less? You know, these landlords have been holding on to these spaces for years and leaving them empty. I don't know, some kinds of tax abatement and they won't lo lower the rents and let market forces rule, <laughs> you know, because their rents should be lower. Well, well, how do I get, how do I know how to negotiate in this context? So, um, I'm really appreciative to Ivia, to Vols. They were generous with their time and support and, and I need them in, in other group family daycares and small uh, mother owned, mom owned businesses like mine who are trying to make the next step to commercial leases. We need this service. So I, I hope it will continue to be funded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, and so many important points that you brought up of the, the technical assistance that will be needed um, going forward um, as businesses are able to, uh, to reopen. So thank you for bringing that up and thank you for your support. Um, next, we'll be hearing from um, Aisha Saeed. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Aisha Saeed. I own a um, fashion design business. I'm a designer and CEO of my business, and we are located on 109 West 38th Street. And it belongs, I believe, falls under the council member powers district. And I've been in this space for almost 10 years. And but the la last year we re renewed our lease and our business started to take off and I signed a five-year lease with our landlord. Not only did I sign the five-year lease, I took on additional space and I put enormous amount of money in renovating our space. It's absolutely beautiful. It's the nicest space in the building. I'm so proud of it. And our business was uh, started to take off this January and February, we had the best sales month ever only for March to come in and sales dropped 95%. And that's been the case since March till now, because our business is very high touch service. Women would come in for fitting and styling. We used our space for events. So everything we did back then to generate sales, we're not able to do right now. So of course that put me in an extremely difficult situation where I was able to cut back on many of my expenses. The only expense that stayed that kept me awake at night was my rent. Um, so much so that I shared a with a client of mine my problem with the landlord and he's demanding rent and all he kept saying was, oh, you know, just give me whatever you have and pay bi-weekly. I'm like, bi-weekly? What is he talking about? There is no money coming in. He can't seem to understand that there is no sales coming in and how am I supposed to pay you? So a client of mine introduced me to CLA program and they immediately took action within, I would say, they asked me to email my lease agreement. Within a couple of days, I received a call from Julia um, who took the time and she went over the lease page by page, clause by clause, clause, explaining to me what the lease was all set up and if I had any is there any way I can get out of it or whatever the details were. And through that process, what I appreciated the most was that there was a human being that I was speaking to on the other end, and I'm not getting charged by them, and they genuinely have interest in helping me. And they were, she was honest, direct, and responsive, and explained to me what the law, what the lease said, and also what Governor um, Cuomo's executive order it has been so far and how it's protecting the tenants. And that's something I really didn't understand. So she walked me through that process as well. And I am so grateful for CLA to, to exist, to actually offer service like this to a small business like myself. I don't have the means to go out and get a lawyer and fight with my landlord. He has a number of different buildings. He has a lot of um, assets behind him and he has attorneys he's working with. I don't have anybody. The CLA was there for me and is for me. 
And I'm so appreciative for what they have provided to small businesses like myself, a woman minority family funded business. So for them not to continue getting funding from the city is really a shame. That's something that I cannot even imagine why they wouldn't do that. Why wouldn't they do that times like this? This is, we're not in the clear. This is just the beginning of the nightmare that small businesses are dealing with. And we're going to be living with this for the rest of the year and going forward. So we need help. We need support. And whoever's listening to this, you have to listen to our voices. We shouldn't have to march. We shouldn't have to cry our hearts out for you to understand the trouble we are in. And we need the support of CLA and the attorneys and everything that they're offering small businesses. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Aisha. Um, you uh, you know brought up so many good points about being a, a family-owned business that you you put so much of your own personal investment in, and it's so important for us, especially for um, for um, minority-owned businesses, to be able to save those those assets um, and to be protected. Um, so I appreciate. Um, you sharing and uh, for your support as well. Um, and uh, last but not least, we will be hearing from um, Amy Sinclair from Sinclair Social. Hi, um, thank you first of all for even having this. I think it's such an important conversation. There's so many people who aren't really um, thinking about this problem from the aspect of the small business owner. So I really, there's so, there's so many issues and so many things happening, but this, I, I just appreciate the town hall for, for this issue. Um, my name is Amy Sinclair. The business that I own is called Sinclair Social. It's an impact focused business. We create community messaging support around issues that have to deal with the sustainable development goals um, that the UN instituted which is reducing poverty, um, increasing health and wellness. And so a lot of the work that we do is for nonprofits and then for um, maybe public health organizations who work with communities. And um, over the last five years, we've been able to grow and, and we picked up significant amount of momentum. But the only issue for us right now is that a lot of our campaigns are tied to event focused things and so that's provided a deep challenge for us because people aren't gathering in person anymore and a lot of our contracts that we had were were tied to that and then in addition to that it's just the the state of the economy is in such a like weird place that people just don't feel comfortable moving forward with proposals so a lot of things are on pause um, my business is located at 405 Lexington Avenue uh, inside the Chrysler Building, all places. Um, and that would be Keith Powers District number four. We currently have our lease set up with um, a co working space. And so, as we saw the stay at home order come down, we reached out to the the office asking them what their process was going to be now that we aren't able to go into the office and the majority of the businesses inside that space are um, non essential. They just completely ignored us. It was crickets. I heard nothing. <laughs> I emailed, I called, I, I did everything that I thought I could possibly do. And I am actually one of uh, a professional at trying to like create change. And so it was very frustrating for me that I wasn't getting any results. Um, so I reached out to small business services who we do do work for. We are, um, we do have some contracts with them um, to see what we could, what resources were available for us. And, and Greg Bishop recommended this program. So um, I, I, I reached out and I spoke to my legal advisor who has been a godsend and amazing. He was able to help me navigate through our very complicated lease, which basically says we don't have any leaseholder tenancy rights. So even if there was some legislation that passed for, for those of uh, commercial lease um, holders, it wouldn't apply to us. <laughs> um, so technically the co-working space that we have would 
would be able to benefit from that because they are the ones who hold the lease. Um, so now we just, we just have a membership agreement. And he was able to walk me through what I needed to say in the letters and correspondence that I wrote back to, back to the uh, co-working space. And immediately after I, I sent that letter with my lawyer, <laughs> CC, they wrote me back. Um, they offered me another option, which I still feel like we need more um, negotiation around. And, and I, I realized the importance of having programs like this because without them, I would have been lost. They would have just kept ignoring me. Uh, and we, we are very passionate about what we're doing. It's also very difficult for me as a minority to secure financing to, and capital for the business itself. So the margins are so small already. Um, having this extra lease payment is just like, it's, it's really difficult for us. We also, there's also the emotional um, aspect of this. I think just being able to like talk to someone who was really listening to me and can help me even think through some of the complexities of dealing with the other person who we, we, we share our space with was incredibly valuable. Um, beyond just the monetary aspect of this, there's a relationship with this other person that I work with. And it's almost the equivalent of like breaking up, like, you know, moving out of an apartment um, with like a life partner. And so just having the support of how to think through that strategically and figure out how to maneuver was, I, I can't um, quantify that in the way that I, I, would, I would like to. Um, and I, I think it's, I think definitely now that we've seen that there is some legislation that is being passed as it relates to rent and knowing that it doesn't apply to the commercial lease side means it's even more important for us to have um, advocacy and support with, with programs like this. Thank you so much for sharing, Amy. You brought up so many good points, um, as well as how um, odds have already been stacked against you as a minority-owned business owner. And um, we, um, we uh, just really appreciate um, you sharing and, uh, and your support. And um, I want to also welcome um, to the event Council Member Carlina Rivera. Um, thank you for joining us here. And um, we will be hearing from you shortly. But thank you so much for all of your support of the program and of all of small business owners across the city. Um, so thank you once again to all of our small business owners for sharing um, your words um, and stories have been truly inspiring um, and have really illustrated so many challenges that you're facing as well as um, the, the need for legal assistance for uh, small business owners and um, to help to continue illustrating that need, um, we'd love to hear from some of the attorneys um, in the program um, to talk about the um, importance of um, access to legal services for small business owners uh, from the legal perspective. Um, I'm not sure who's, who's gonna kick us off. Um, Ivia, will you, will you start us off? Sure. Um, and I'd just like to reiterate, thank you everyone for joining and um, showing your support for this critical program at such a critical time. Um, I think it's evident from the clients that we just heard from uh, about the need for these services, um, but I'd like to highlight a few more examples of, of my personal experience representing small businesses for the past year or so um, of, of what could transpire if this program just ceases to end at the end of this month. Um, I've, you know, I'm currently negotiating a few termination agreements for clients who have you know, decided to move out um, and who otherwise would have moved out and vacated their space without getting their landlord to sign a written agreement because they didn't realize uh, what could potentially happen if they didn't. Um, so you know, by doing so, uh, they could ex you know, expose themselves to further liability down the road and further claims by the landlord um, that, they could, that could be avoided um, if they have representation, uh, if they have uh, access to attorneys to explain what you know what their rights are and what their options are 
um, and who have you know, more of a bandwidth to negotiate these termination agreements with landlords and landlords attorneys. Um, so you know, I can't imagine what would happen if um, you know, we're not funded to provide these services anymore and, and more and more clients are making these decisions you know, at, you know, as, as the summer goes on. Um, uh, another type of, of uh, assistance that I can attest to is uh, many times tenants in general just don't understand what their rights are under their leases, what, what, pro what provisions under their leases state, um, especially if they couldn't afford a an attorney to negotiate it for them. So I've had several clients who didn't even realize that they have termination rights in their leases um, or good guy clauses in their leases that, you know, that give them the option of potentially canceling their leases um, by providing notice or just or abiding by other conditions under the lease. Um, and I imagine there are many, many other uh, small businesses in the city that uh, could um, benefit from, from this type of counsel as well. Um, another type of matter that I think it's important to highlight is um, clients whose leases are expiring either this month or next month. Um, and who, you know, we're currently trying to negotiate renewals for them. Um, if, if a lot of times these negotiations go longer than expected. So um, I, I really don't know what would happen to my clients if suddenly, you know, our program ceases to exist and we can't provide them these services anymore. Um, they would be extremely disadvantaged in a situation where they have, you know, they're up against it and other attorneys um, who, you know, who are representing property owners and landlords and trying to um, get more favorable lease provisions for their clients. Um, so, you know, countless small businesses like my clients would be disadvantaged, I think, without legal representation um, and property owners. They will continue to have their unfair advantages, um, whether this program existed, uh, even if, you know, especially if this program uh, fails to um, continue. Um, you know, they'll continue to negotiate new leases and, and have counsel representing them and ensuring their, um, ensuring their best interests are, 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 um, are accounted for in, in, in lease provisions. Uh, they won't cease to demand rent from clients, from small business clients who, who don't have, uh, who can't afford uh, rent um, and have suffered from this un unprecedented pandemic um, and, and obtain legal counsel um, to, to explain to them what their potential rights are under new legislation that's being passed or um, um, helping them access um, uh, funding available to small businesses and, and understanding what, you know, what, is, what, what is required to, to obtain loans and grants. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, prog the progress that this program is, is making um, would be extremely hindered if, if, you know, if we were to be defended. So, uh, that's you know, just a little bit from my perspective. Thanks so much, Avia. Um, and we will uh, now hear from uh, Julia Curry. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I just want to say a few words about the program. My experience thus far, I actually joined uh, Vols in February of this year, about three weeks before uh, the city was shut down for COVID-19. And we were essentially plunged into a small business crisis. Um, I think the tremendous volume of cases that we are seeing now is sort of illustrative of, you know, the success of this program. We haven't had to turn people away. And it's also, you know, demonstrates that there is some ability to have sort of a pressure valve with this program um, for the, the kind of uh, cases that we're seeing. So in general, um, I've been able, I've been given the opportunity to provide people with, you know, a full rundown of their rights and obligations under their leases, as well as the rapidly changing um, legal situation and executive orders. But moreover, you know, we, we hear a lot from our colleagues, from other colleagues in commercial leasing and pro bono partners that they don't feel that landlords are willing to negotiate, that they're just going to stonewall. Well, CLA program proves that's not the case. I mean, I have clients with landlords who are unresponsive, but I have just as many clients with landlords who are willing to negotiate. And I've been able to engage with them and engage with my clients to negotiate um, rent abatements, waivers, rent reductions, as well as deferments, and if necessary, terminations of leases. Um, the CLA program provides an opportunity to de-escalate disputes and really change the course for, for these kinds of cases that could turn into litigation 
as well as um, potentially the elimination of these vital small businesses. That's all I have. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, and right before uh, hearing from the council member, um, I just want to hear from um, Julian, uh, who is another attorney uh, with the program. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Julian Hill. I'm a supervising attorney at Take Root Justice, where we believe that we can only start to eliminate social, racial, and economic oppression if we invest in supporting organizing. Um, so what we're talking about is functionally about power. Uh, four years ago, USBNYC, United for Small Business, really pushed the administration to provide a service that was supposed to address the inherent imbalances in commercial leases. When we think about landlords, it's been referenced, they have their fancy attorneys. I used to work at a law firm, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that they have their nice fancy attorneys. They have done multiple dozens, hundreds of these sorts of negotiations before, and they're really working with leases that are really designed um, to, to shift the burden to their, their, the tenants. And commercial tenants, on the other hand, this is the first time they're doing it. You give them 55 pages of legal language, it's, it's overwhelming. And at that time, they didn't have an attorney to, to look after their interests. And so now we have this program, and as has been referenced before, it, it's made a difference. Um, we, we think about the time before COVID, you know, you're talking about situations where I had a client operating for 40 years. We were able to get her three extra months in her lease, even though it had expired, so that she could terminate it and give herself enough cushion to move into her new location. Because um, under her lease, they could have kicked her to the, to the curb. And so we were able to sort of sort of help her in that situation. And then we think about the difference the program is making now. I mean, you talk about clients who might have been behind in rent for, for months, and who are, you know, we're helping to negotiate different sorts of payment plans, we're supporting with PPP applications, and, and, and there's a little bit of a light at the end of the, at the, end of the tunnel. And so I think people are, are aware of the fact that the CLA program obviously is supporting legal services, but I think it would, it's really important also to also recognize that we do have com community-based organizations that really were at the forefront of making people even know that this pro program exists when we started three years ago. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that there's a lot of organizing that has been supported. Commercial tenant organizing is hard. It's not residential tenant organizing, which, may, which people may be familiar with. A lot of our clients come in through our, through our CBOs. A lot of people become aware of the program because of the CBOs. And I think that there's power being built to, to address the imbalances that we, we saw and we tried to address four years ago. And the idea of this program being defunded not only is gonna bring a reality where we're really gonna go back to, to four years ago, um, but even worse given what's going on with the pandemic, but also we're gonna really lose out on a lot of the great organizing, the great relationship building that has been happening over the past several years with, with some of these community-based organizations throughout the city that have really been, been supporting our small businesses. And so that's what's at stake if we don't fund this program. So thank you for, for listening. I guess I will go ahead and um, introduce uh, the council member Rivera. You have a number of businesses that were on the panel. You have a number of businesses who are here. And so I think it means a lot for, for us. I think it means a lot to, to the folks here on the, on the panel your businesses and your district for you to be here. So I'm gonna pass it off to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, I did, I have been in and out of this, in a, but I did get to see the testimonies from Ashley and of course, Jay Antonio, oh my goodness. You have this, um, this mirror, like you have these, anyway, you have beautiful things in your store. And I remember saying before I was elected that when I got a little bit more money, I was gonna go back in there. So I just want you to know I'm on my way. All right, so to everyone who shared their experiences, I just wanna thank you because um, I get to represent my community where I was born and raised. And I know exactly what it's like uh, uh, to provide that referral, right? To be that organizer. I used to work at Good Old Lower East Side and small businesses would come in all the time looking for assistance. 
And most of the time I would say, I think you need an attorney. I think you need to, here's this list of resources. Here are the organizations that are doing work exactly around this issue. And let's make a referral so you can talk to someone right away. That is very, very powerful. And I would not want any organizer or any person who cares about the survival of small businesses to not be able to say that and to help someone. So right now it's really, really hard because I know there's so many thoughts and and um, Amy, right? Uh, Sinclair, when you said about the emotional piece, about how emotional it can get, because this is your lives and your dreams and everything that you've poured into it. And so I know with rent and, you know, right now with some of the businesses, I, I went and visited, I don't know, a dozen businesses already in my district who have experienced vandalism. And I think what's so amazing is that they're like, listen, we're here. We're in, we're in the movement. We get it. Like we are, we are here. It happened. It's terrible, but we have to figure out how we can come together as a community and whether it's emotional, spiritual, or financial, we have to figure out how to support you so that way you can open your door safely, feel like you have everything you need and that you have the connections and the relationships um to to support you so that that's why i'm here today because i think that the commercial lease assistance program is so so important and i am committed to fighting to have it restored and to make sure that the all of the attorneys and all of the advocates and the experts can continue to do their work uh you know i was on my community board as well uh a few years ago and i remember a few years ago i guess it was like 2010 at this point um and I remember we were like, we need to do a, a small business guide to lease negotiations. And we spent a lot of time doing this pamphlet. The first thing we put on the first page was you should go seek an attorney. That was the first thing we did. We gave very, very basic how to's, but we wanted people to be able to work with take root and people like Bowles and, and make sure Brooklyn A um that you are the ones that really understand each and every neighborhood and i'm trying in other ways to also support you all make sure that not only do we fund this program we take care of the organizations that provide those referrals that we make sure that we're taking care of our legal aid attorneys who really do this for the passion not the money i know that for of course for the small businesses and and, and passing legislation like opening streets so that way we you know when we start reopening at a faster pace at limited occupancy that people can go and spill out into the streets responsibly. Uh, the temporary suspension of personal liability because of that good guy clause that was mentioned earlier. Um, so I really want to just be here to tell you that thank you uh, for sharing your story. It's not easy. I do love when you said, uh, Jesse, about, but I'm not a lawyer. You know, I might be a lot of things, but I'm not a lawyer. So that is why I think this coalition is so important and why I wanted to be here uh, to listen and just lend my words of support and, and you all let me know what I can do and, and to hold me accountable. And there's nothing more I want for as many businesses as possible to go back and reopen and start serving the community that they love and bring those workers back on because I know you're desperate uh, to bring your workers back and to put them back on payroll because they are a part of all of our extended families. So thank you. Thank you to all of you for organizing. And you know, one thing I forgot to add is like, actually my husband is a small business owner. And I just want you to know that it has been so, so difficult. If I could just be personal for one second, I've seen uh, commercial leases go pretty badly. Like a lot of uh, fear in my home and the emotion is there and it would be there with us here in the house. And I've been there, you know, emptying out a storefront before midnight, right? Right before the first of the month. So I just want you to know that I realize that um, it's really hard um, to feel like you have power, but um, with this support and with the right tools and the right programs, um, I really want you to know that you are supported in City Hall. So, so thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support and your commitment and your leadership and all that you do every day, Councilmember Rivera. We are so grateful to have you on our side. Um, and I will now turn it over to um, Arthur Katz. 
uh, to say a couple words, and then we will um, open it up to question and answers. Um, so feel free to start putting your questions into the chat box. Um, and our um, attorneys and program managers and everyone will be here to answer your questions. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. Thank you, small business owners. Thank you, everybody who's here today listening to us talk about the work that we're doing that we hope to do in the future. Um, I just wanted to take you back because I was back on the ground floor when this program was getting started, when the three organizations got put together. We met the call um, with the help of USBNYC to make an economic justice program. We made the call, we met the call to make a racial justice program. 99% of our clients are low income. 75% of our clients are people of color. We serve people who don't speak English. We serve people in outer boroughs. Um, we serve immigrants, minorities, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, queer-owned businesses. Those are our focal points. Those are, those are the business owners who haven't had the tools who haven't had the access to resources that we focus on. And, and we get results. I still have, I come from private practice um, before I jumped ship and, and became a nonprofit attorney. And I still have a network of private attorneys who are having a really hard time um, uh, representing commercial tenants uh, against their landlords. Um, and, I, and I hear that throughout the chatter. I hear that in the, in the bar. Um, we, on the other hand, get results. It's hard. My team works really hard. The Brooklyn A team works really hard, as does the Taper Justice team. But as you heard, we are getting results for our clients. We are getting terminations. We are getting abatements. We are getting agreements. We are getting certainty for these clients at a moment when they need it most, right? And just keep in mind, the courts are about to reopen. Landlords are getting their papers together for all of the months of rent that, that clients couldn't, couldn't be paying because they've been forced to close because of the pause order. Um, and so just because they're about allowed to reopen doesn't mean that their problems are about to cease. So I just, I wanted to say thank you to the small business owners today who shared your stories. Thank you to the CLA attorneys who are continuing to fight every single day. Um, and thank you to Council Member Rivera and the rest of the council who can hopefully keep this program to continue. Thank you, Arthur, and thank you again to everyone. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ken Ross to tell um, everyone that's on the call. And just as an update, we have 84 people here. That's incredible. Um, thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, so Ken is going to tell us how um, you can how you can reach us, how you can get services from the program, um, and learn more. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, thank you all for um, speaking, Arthur, Julian, uh, Ivia, Julia, <clears throat> Councilmember Rivera. Thank you so much for for joining us. And um, as you know, that district, your district, is the one that we are most concentrated in, and uh, so we we are very grateful for your support over the years. Um, so I think the the question is continue to pop up on the chat before we get into the questions. Is it how you can contact us? So um, there are various ways of doing that. I will put um, my email address directly. So, um, and several uh, small business owners have mentioned a quick turnaround. So that is something that we uh, pride ourselves in, that um, we contact someone who reaches out to us within uh, 70, 48 to 72 hours, and an attorney will contact you um, once you have been screened within another 72 hours. And um, I think about 60% of our uh, small business clients I've spoken to personally as the first point of contact. So um, I, I feel like I'm scrolling through the names and, and I feel like I, I know many of you, but, um, and that's something that I do want to focus on because we have gotten that feedback from people, particularly during COVID, that a bank um, is not speaking to them no city agency is speaking to them. And we were, uh, we actually called. Um, and that was very important to us, but it was also um, very disappointing that in, in a moment that people are literally thinking they're, they may lose their lives and they may lose their livelihood that no one could get through to an actual person. And, and that we were able to not just speak to them, but actually provide 
service um, is something that um, we are all proud of in this program. So I will have um, my email in there. Uh, through that email, you can you know you can contact the rest of us at the three organizations. Um, the other organizations can also put their emails on. I'm not going to volunteer them. Um, to contact us, whether you have questions about what's happening with the CLA program, or if um, you would like to help us, and there'll be uh, more information on how you can help us uh, secure this funding going forward. I also want to mention that uh, while we are not taking on new clients just for a few weeks, hopefully we will be renewed very, very quickly. We do have uh, resources that we can share with you. Um, in the chat, one is the commercial leasing FAQs. Those are very important questions that business owners have brought to us, uh, particularly about rent, um, but all kinds of questions about um, what's happening during the lockdown and what's gonna happen when they reopen. And um, for brief advice uh, consultations, as I mentioned earlier, we have our partners and friends at the SBLRA who um, are available to speak to small business owners on um, brief advice matters and consultations. So um, Arthur just put that in the chat as well. And um, so those are two resources that complement our services and we partner with. Um, and well, in FAQs we created. So um, those are things that are available um, while we go through this process. Thanks, Ken. Um, and if um, anyone is interested in helping us to push advocacy for restoration for funding for the program, please also um, let us know and we will um, let you know how to help us with that. Um, so I want to turn it over to um, our audience to ask, uh, to ask any questions that you have. I know that there um, are a few few questions already in the chat. Um, I want to see if we can hear from um, Modup, who has had their hand raised for a while. So let me see if I can allow you to speak. Hello, Hi. welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, um, I'm a new owner and I'm a designer doing um, African dresses. And um, I opened like late two, uh, 2018. And everything, it was great until the COVID-19 and I was, you know, unable to open up. I have um, just um, a, a one tailor in my store People come in, we do wedding dresses, prom dresses. As a matter of fact, this is our busy time. But because of the COVID, we're locked, you know. So, um, and I've tried to apply for, you know, different loans. There's no lock yet. And at the same time for the, um, the rent, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how, you know, because the landlord has been emailing me, sending me texts, calling me every day that what am I going to do? So um, I don't know what to, to do. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll allow any of the um, attorneys to, um, to, to take that. OK, thank you. I can take I can take a stab at this one. So I um, the the place to start um, uh, Madube is your lease. So um, we'll have to take a look there and see what options there are available for you. Um, commercial tenants are in a really hard place right now because many 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 can't open and generate revenue because of the governor's orders. But a lot of times your rent continues to be due because of what the lease says, and the lease is what governs, right? It's not like a lease for your apartment where there's all kinds of additional laws and protections that you might have. Um, a commercial lease, you only have the protections that exist in that document itself. 
So the first thing that would have to do is um, you or um, a, a lawyer, um, if the CLA program was around, would be able to go and read your lease and help you understand what's in it. If there's any opportunity for you to be able to stop your rent payments, to suspend your rent payments because of what's going on that's beyond your control, that would be our first avenue. Our second okay. avenue would be if there's no opportunity in the lease to suspend your rent payments, to go and see if we can negotiate with your landlord and explain to them, look, this business isn't um, able to be open at the moment. I don't know what you want from them. Um, let's make a deal so that when the business is able to reopen, you'll give them the opportunity to start paying the rent then again. But just know that if in, in almost all instances, if you do make a deal with the landlord, it has to be written down in an agreement. It can't just be on the phone or sort of an oral understanding, right? So that's another place where it's really important to have an attorney so that um, everything that you agree with the landlord on is actually in on in writing, in paper, and everybody signs it and everybody knows what it is. So there's no disagreement later on when you're, when you're actually able to reopen. Some of the other um, items that we're talking about with small business owners um, are things outside of your lease. Like, um, are you uh, participating in any of the government funding programs? Did you participate in the SBS program? When yes, I did. I did, but I didn't, um, the, the bank already, uh, my bank, my, where I opened the business, they already um, reject because they said I don't have a payroll because I have only one tailor and I pay him by cash. So they said um, they cannot get me the loan. Um, and I didn't hear from the government um, yet. I see. Okay, yeah, there are, there, so there are a number of different programs available that give loans. Some of them are forgivable and it's based upon payroll. So that might be what you're coming up against is being able to prove the amount of payroll that you're paying your tailor. There's also expanded protections for small business owners under the unemployment insurance laws. So the CARES Act extended a lot of protections to folks who weren't otherwise qualified before. So freelancers, gig workers, sole practitioners, people who no longer have any employees because of the crisis may be eligible for unemployment and uh, benefits as well, which is another program that would be able to give you some um, some some funds, some some money okay. um, in the meantime. So that might be another thing that we'd be able to help you with is, is navigating okay. those programs. And then, you know, a lot of small business owners are also required to or hold uh, business insurance policies um, under their leases for their spaces. And so sometimes there might be some ability to read that uh, insurance policy uh, and see if there's any way to, to recoup some money or make a claim um, to, to help you through this crisis through your insurance policy that you already pay for um, and have that protection. Um, so, you know- Can I say something? Please. Can I, about the insurance, I contact my insurance. They said they don't co cover um, COVID-19, that they, they, it's not covered. Right, and so we're seeing that, we're seeing that a lot. There's a, there's a provision in many, many, many uh, business insurance policies, unfortunately, that says that they don't cover anything that has to do with a bacteria or a virus, that all of those things are excluded. And so um, there's currently a bill in Albany that we've been following very closely that would get rid of that restriction. Um, otherwise, we've, uh, we've worked with a pro bono partner to create a, um, a, a guide for, uh, for folks who are, are, are looking to review their business insurance policies and figure out whether they can file claims. So I'd be happy to share that with you as well. It's on our website, valsprobono.org. We have a number of resources there, not just, the, um, not just the business insurance guide. We also have an FAQ video in Spanish and English about commercial tenant issues. We have a federal and private uh, financial resource guides in Spanish, Mandarin, and English. Um, take a look on our website. Um, and if you leave your uh, email in the chat box, I'd be happy to uh, reach out to you with the business insurance and the unemployment insurance um, information. Yeah, if I can, if I can add to, to that uh, briefly, I think Arthur covered like the main sort of two buckets, which is the, the lease itself. And then outside of the lease, negotiating with your, your landlord, I think a third bucket is really kind of sort of different forms of advocacy. And so to the extent that you have relationships with different forms of media, depending on if you have relationships with um, influential folks in your community, whether they're um, political or otherwise, that's sometimes a, a third avenue that is outside the lease, is outside your connections and interactions with your landlord, but can sometimes yield some, some positive results.
Um, I was wondering if I could say something really quickly about that. So that was that was one of the things that we did. We were very frustrated. So we reached out to New York One News and talked to them about this issue. The fact that our um, parent company is the biggest co-working space in the world. And the fact that WeWork, which is also another co-working space, holds the largest amount of private office space in New York City um, means that a lot of the businesses that are here are in a co-working space. And we felt like the fact that our um, lease holder was not responsive to us and that they weren't willing to work with us was very irresponsible. And so we, we were on the news um, a couple weeks ago. And I think that definitely was helpful for us. And so that 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 um, advocacy of reaching out and speaking to the press can be very, very helpful. And so that is something that we've done and we will continue to do. Uh, thanks for adding that, Amy. Yes, very, uh, very important part. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I also want to um, thank Jesse who needs to hop off. Um, Oh, let me unmute you. I just want to thank everybody and, and know that this program must be refunded, but I have a curfew. And my husband just texted me and said, I want you home by eight because you're brown. <laughs> I said, I, I got it. I got it. So I, I want to thank everybody and say good night to everyone and thank you so much. And good luck to all of us. And you must fund this program again. There's good night. Good night, Jesse. Thank you so much. And please Jesse. be safe. Um, okay, so uh, next we'll hear from um, Taryn Harris. Hello. Hi, Welcome, Taryn. Um, people know me as Adrian Harris. Um, I own a business in Brooklyn for the past 10 years. And one thing I would like to say is that Vols saved me. Um, even before Evia came in, Arthur was amazing. And then Evia just, you know, took off. And to this day, um, they're still helping me, even though three years ago, I needed to sell my business and or get out of my lease. And here I am, I was supposed to sell my business two days before COVID. And now um, they backed out of the sale. So um, it's like a nightmare. But anyway, um, what my concern is, I have a landlord who is up my, you know what, um, every month and I'm three months behind now and I don't know uh, what to do. I owe about $35,000. And with the business, I own a doggy daycare grooming um, dog walking facility. And um, with this, um, once we do be open, we're not going to have the business that we had before because most people are working from home. So they do not need dog walking. They do not need five days a, a week a daycare um, and grooming. Yes, they'll need, but that, but that's, you know, it's crazy. Anyway, um, I'm really considering shutting my doors. Um, because I'm, I'm in a place where I don't even know what to do anymore. I'm, I'm psychologically so messed up. And uh, as a matter of fact, my partner tells me every day to go get help. And, uh, you know, I haven't done it. I tried, but nobody wants to um, call me back. That's what people do these days. They don't like to call you back. And that's with my PP loan. I had that problem with Cabbage Bank. Nobody will call me back. Nobody called me back from the SBA. So, you know, I just have a few issues going on. And um, I can't, I wish I sold my store so I wouldn't have to deal with any of this. And I'm so sorry, everybody has to be going through this. 
That's it. And the pro bono, I will get in touch with you guys regarding um, sale of the business. Maybe somebody can help me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And um, so sorry to hear about all that you're going through. Um, know that we are with you. And if there's anything that we can do to help, um, please don't hesitate to, to reach out and know that you are not alone um, in this in this, these really, really hard times. Arthur, um, do you have to say something? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, hi, Taryn. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, I, I just wanted to say I, I feel for you so much. And, um, you know, small businesses are already hurting, but landlords still think it's the same world that they're living in and they're just going to jump right back. And they're going to be right unless there's advocates out there who are, um, who are really speaking or, and, and helping small business owners with their voice here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be complicated. It's got to be hard. What's all these acronyms, PPP, SBA. It took me a while to figure out what everything was so I can put it down on paper and explain it to, to, to other folks. Um, I, I, I can't imagine how small businesses will be able to um, get, make it through and recover without, without partnership um, from, from, from the legal services community. Um, I, so I, I do have one question. Um, if you are to leave your lease, um, by September 20th. Um, is it that they cannot go after you if you have um, a guarantor? Um, does anybody know what I'm talking about the September 20th? Yeah. So I believe, I believe Council Member Rivera was a co-sponsor on the bill or maybe a prime sponsor on the personal liability suspension bill um, that we supported wholeheartedly. Uh, it's a brand new piece of legislation uh, just signed by the mayor we don't know yet uh, what's going to happen with it because it hasn't yet been tested. Obviously, the landlords are not happy with it. They're going to be fighting it in court. Um, there's no certainty that I can give you at the moment other than the fact that the city council thought that this was important and got it through. Um, and so we're still figuring out what it actually means in court um, when a business has to incur personal liability as a result of COVID-19. Okay. And rest assured, this is going to be happening and this is going to be litigated in the courts. Um, and, and we hope that there's going to be some pretty good attorneys on the tenant side to fight for this law. And, and can I just add that one of the, all, another reason I think the bill was important to pass is even though people, you know, questioned it, to send a message to landlords who were kind of plotting and thinking of doing it or whatever it was to so just let them know that there is a whole body of legislators watching with advocates behind them to say, you know, in the middle of a global pandemic, it is a moral failure to come after someone's personal savings who wants nothing more but to reopen their business. So yes, I think it's actually come up already with maybe a, a restaurant fig and olive. Um, but I mean, so we'll see how that goes. But I mean, I've heard landlords who are going to some of these small businesses and trying to raise rent. Oh boy. So we, had, we really wanted to try everything um, that we could. And sometimes, you know, we have limited power, but I, I thought that that piece was really important. And hopefully people, if they do have to walk away from their business, they can come back and start something else and, and not go into personal bankruptcy. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah, so this is Mia Clay. Hi, I'm the director of the Community and Economic Development Program at Brooklyn A. Um, and a large portion of what we do is uh, doing the great work that you all have heard about um, with the CLA program, helping small businesses. Um, like uh, Arthur and Julia and I come from corporate law, so I know where folks have that power there and what it looks like and how disadvantaged uh, folks on the other side are who don't have it. Uh, folks who look a lot like me and many other people on this call uh, we are primarily serving, um, as Arthur uh, said very well, uh, women, uh, people of color, immigrants. Those are the folks, um, I think I heard Amy say, who's, they're small margins and folks are living um, as it is enough on the edge. And so I just want to say one, thank you, Council Member Rivera, for all the work you're doing and for just letting people know that uh, there are people with power who are paying attention and watching. Um, I wanna say to Taryn, um, just thank you for sharing 
um, something that's so personal and uh, emotional. And, and the reason is because that's uh, the one thing that I, I know we've heard a lot about investing in our small businesses. We've heard a lot about um, preserving dreams. But I think the other piece of this that we have to realize um, if, we, or if we're talking about a tell of two cities and a tell of two stories is on the other side of that is something that looks very different. Um, this is, as Karen just described, a health crisis as much as it is a, a small business crisis. These folks who have small margins and who for everything, their brick and mortar um, is also their shelter for their family. It's their, it's their access to health, it's their access to food. Uh, the $1.2 million uh, that this program is, is, is low compared to the cost uh, to the city and the increase in the deficit. If these people who are already on the margins um, lose the very thing that gives them the access to the basic needs that we all deserve. And so I just want to thank everyone for um, sharing your story. And I just want to say, Taryn, uh, thank you as well for adding that, that real element there about how, how quickly this becomes as well a health crisis for folks. Well, thank you. Um, I, and you mentioned about investment and I know somebody else on the board has a family business, but um, I, I personally um, invested $300,000 10 years ago to build my business and to open it. And this is just so devastating at this point, but my health, my health is not good. Um, and that, that was one of the reasons why I was selling the business. And now, you know, between my physical and emotional, I, I just, I, I feel like I'm not strong enough to even open in two weeks um, because I'm alone. Thank you. Thank you so much once again for sharing um, such a personal and, and moving story. And we do um, sincerely wish you wish you the best uh, for your health and business and well being. And um, and thank you for joining us um, and and sharing such a personal story. Um, so being mindful of everyone's um, time and also that we uh, that New York City is under curfew right now, um, I um, think we should close um, up the uh, the event. But um, you know, I'll turn it over to Ken to uh, to wrap things up, as well as uh, to share how um, folks can continue to be involved. Um, in the advocacy for restoration for funding for the program, um, as well as any last words. So once again, thank you to everyone for joining us um, and uh, we'll hear from Ken. Sure, um, so let's think about this. There are hundreds of thousands of eligible businesses for the CLA program in the city. And the program as it is, is five attorneys and 1.2 million. And the city believes that is too much. That is not just unacceptable, uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, we should be having a conversation about if we want to truly, and, and let's face it, small businesses were struggling before COVID. Um, the margins, the average black and brown business has 14 days of um, savings, that is, you know, that's a Brookings um, institution study, 14 days of savings. We've asked them to close for months. Um, and I've spoken to people who came to us and said, well, what is going to happen if I can't open up in two or three months? So they need those questions answered and they need people who are going to not just advocate for them but get legal services done. So, I, I know for, for many of us who are supportive of this program, who have benefited from this program, it just seems kind of strange that at a time when the city wants to uh, reopen and small businesses are its engine, particularly immigrant, black and brown, uh, minority, women owned small businesses account for the vast majority of businesses, that this very, very simple tool, they would deny them. And that is something that um, as we move forward with, with this advocacy, it gives me hope that um, this is a very ground floor ask 
for the survival of small businesses in the city. And it's not like an experiment. We know what will happen. We know what will happen in commercial corridors if businesses never reopen. They will call it blight. And then they will talk about revitalization and urban renewal. And what is gonna happen is chain pharmacies and uh, big banks are gonna take over those spaces. So there is value, economic, cultural, and social value to small businesses that we are trying to literally save. But there is also the issue that they're not gonna be replaced by other small businesses. That's not how it works. That's not how it has worked in many neighborhoods in New York City. So we have to be very, very mindful of this is a moment where the city has to choose what it does with small businesses. And we are a small part of that. So um, oftentimes I feel like I'm speaking to the choir because um, businesses love this program, advocates love this program, um, SBS loves this program. Um, we just need this program funded uh, so we can continue to do this work. And as the speakers have mentioned, a lot of work went into this. Um, a lot of work goes in to strengthening and sustaining small businesses. USB NYC has done an incredible job of advocating and pushing forward these very vital issues. We are but one um, of the many things that they are addressing that we know small businesses need, but we are so grateful that they have taken on this cause once again. Um, they got us to the program's launch and they have been steadfast and amazing um, advocates for the program's refunding. I want to thank um, our CBOs. We work with community-based partners across New York City. Those are people who have cultural competency and cultural currency in the communities that are least um, able to access services. And through them, there's a bridge and they have been fantastic with advocating for our program. So I wanna thank them as well. Many of um, them are on the chat today. So, so thank you for standing with us. Uh, thank you for um, helping us help these communities um, and small businesses. Um, today, I got a letter just before this started of a small business owner who took it upon herself to write a letter to her city council person, to council member Perkins. And she said, I'm gonna call this office every day and leave a message um, that this program needs to be refunded and did this upon herself. Um, so that's the advocacy that we appreciate and we love and we need. So um, going forward, we would love for you to help us in, in the ways that are comfortable, in the ways that um, work for you, whether it's social media, it is uh, sending a letter, sending an email to um, the administration. We have those tools. Um, and um, so what we're gonna do is we have our social media toolkit that we're gonna put in the chat. But more importantly, if, if there's a way that you want to help us or you want to help city council members like council member Rivera um, advocate for this and other issues that are vital to small businesses, contact me. Um, I will have my phone 24 seven until this is uh, refunded. Um, so I will take your emails um, and your calls and uh, discuss any strategies that you want to uh, put into place. Okay, so um, the uh, Google Doc of, of various ways you can uh, help us is in the chat. And I will once again put my email, contact us, contact um, the folks that you know in the program, either your attorney, um, the directors and managers, they will have information on how you can help us. Um, our hashtag is FundCLA. It is very simple, it's very vital. It is um, very, very important. So, so thank you again uh, for attending this, for sharing your stories, for sharing your support. And um, hopefully in a few weeks, uh, we will be open for business and many, many businesses in the city will be open for business. All right. Um, Sarah, anything else or we are? No, that's that, that's it. So thank you again, everyone. Um, Council Member Rivera, we also just have a quick question. Um, if you want to let us know anything that small business or advocates can do differently or better to help you in advocating for the program, please do let us know. 
Yeah, you know, I would say a couple of people to that are on the budget negotiation team, which if you don't know, it's a smaller group of certain council members from every borough, kind of from every background. Um, and that's where we talk a lot about cuts and restoration and saving programs. So a couple of people that are on that, um, who really, I think, talk about small businesses a lot. I know Diane Ayala couldn't make it today uh, because, I mean, some of her businesses were actually uh, being affected. And uh, Robert Cornegy has been very, very vocal. Um, and then people on the small business, I think, just just stay in touch with them. The, the emails work. You know, we see them, we see the volume. A personal touch is always, always uh, great. You know, I, I, I look at all the templates, the ones that are long form, I count them, how many. And then when there's a personal touch, a personal story, please believe I will read that. So I, I hope that other council members respond the same, um, but just keep it up because I really don't think we're gonna get to a, a final budget until much later in the month because of everything is kind of up in the air. Uh, so just, I know it seems like the longest month ever and it's June 4th, but um, keep going. We need you and we, we can win this. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone so much for being here. Uh, we will be in touch. Um, thank you for your time. I know there's so many places you can be right now. So many fights to fight. Um, and we're so happy that you're here with us. So. Take care, everyone. Please be safe. Take care of yourselves. Drink water. Get rest. Um, do it all. <laughs> and we'll see you soon. Yeah, take care.